take a breath um, because this is an iconic moment. So, you know, thank you to all of our viewers and all of our stakeholders and everybody who's made this possible, and particularly uh, our teams who've been working on these images tirelessly. So it's a great delight. And without further ado, I will now reveal the first image in our sequence. And here is the first sight of our Euclid image. Thank you for introducing this first image, Carol. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what we can see here. Yeah, so dazzling, I think, is the first word to describe here. Um, so what you can see here is one of the, the biggest uh, gravitationally pulled together structures that we have in the local universe. This is a galaxy cluster called Perseus. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. And we expect to find many of these in the Euclid universe. But each of the dots on this image, most of them um, are galaxies in the distant universe. So we think there's something like 100,000 galaxies in this slice of the sky, going back into cosmic time, about 10 billion years. And then we've got nearby galaxies and all of those distant ones. And so there's a huge amount of data alone in this image to mine. In fact, I was already zooming in on this when I had a sneak preview. So there's, I think there's a lot. We can even zoom in a little bit. We here. can actually. I think yeah. there's probably a zoom we have now. Um, and you can start to see the, the distant points, but actually even nearby, we've got distorted galaxies. Um, we have pairs. We have lovely spiral galaxies, a bit like the Milky Way. Um, so we've got all sorts of things in here. I know our scientists will probably be going to ESA Sky to dig into this. Um, and then, of course, you can see these, these distant objects. These bright things here that actually have the spikes, these so-called diffraction spikes, these are stars in our own galaxy. And so, obviously, we'll also be able to do some galactic science for free along the way. But yeah, there's just so much rich science and physics to be extracted from these images. And of course, the colors themselves tell us something about the physics encoded in the light, too. So we've got lots of codes to decode uh, as we work through this. But what we also know is that the dark matter and dark energy Energy and the physics that um, govern those are also encoded in the shapes and the structures and the patterns that we will see with these Euclid images as we, we build up the survey. That's, it's so incredible to hear how much can come out of these images. I'm very happy to also be joined by Jean-Charles Coulombo, an expert in wide field ultra deep imaging. Jean-Charles, can you explain a bit about what these galaxies that we see here will tell us? So, uh, so this large image, which captures the whole field of view of Euclid, actually is pretty obvious you have some large objects, which are actually sitting on the tip of your nose because they're only 200 million light years away. Uh, and like Carol just said, like if you project that same structure beyond, you will see all these little dots. So it's kind, it's kind of the universe repeating itself in this structure on and on. So what we know with this structure, you almost can see it on the screen, is that you, we talked about filaments and dark matter and dark energy. And so we know there's a comics, cosmic web, that's the way the, the universe is structured. And, uh, Clusters usually condense at the, at the crossroad of uh, filaments of dark matter. And so this is a great example because we know from looking at all these galaxies that you have a filament that go left, right. Mm -hmm. You almost see it, right? And one which is top down, which you go get a sense because of the over density of galaxies. And so that's why this Perseus cluster uh, is a good sample for, for now to study, well, the astrophysics, how objects do behave in this sort of environment. Fantastic. And I think yeah, we even have uh, a closer up view of the Perseus cluster. Yeah, so in this one, just like Carol was mentioning, we, we see like a diversity of uh, types of galaxies. You have spirals, you have ellipticals, and then we have also dwarfs, tons of dwarfs, because you know, the, the smaller you get into the, uh, the zoo of galaxies in uh, clusters, the more you find them. And so this feels already has revealed a tons of, uh, of these dwarf galaxies. Very exciting. Fantastic. And Carol, we've imaged the, the Perseus galaxy cluster before with other telescopes. What makes Euclid's view so special? I think there are two things that are very special about Euclid. The fact that we can do such a broad area immediately. So as, as Jean-Charles said, you see immediately the cosmic structures, which you know scientists in the past have painstakingly tried to take little pieces of the data. You know, you find a galaxy, you measure its position, and then you slowly build up this map. So they were really the forerunners for this. We knew that there was a hint of these filamentary structures, and that was really what motivated us to actually to, to build this mission. And immediately it pops out as you know, just one image, there you go, there's the filament. So 
think of the potential of that. But also the fact that it is so sensitive, as Jean-Charles says, it's sensitive enough to pick up the smallest galaxies, which are faint, um, but it also has exquisite precision in its optics. So these faint small galaxies, if we look from the ground, they would be merged in. We wouldn't be able to distinguish them in detail. And if we look at them with uh, current space missions, for example, Hubble, which has been great, and Webb as well, which is doing really important work, we would only be doing a little patch of the sky. So it's combining that, that wide area, the depth and the precision, you then get these crystal clear and uh, stunning images going back in cosmic time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carol and Jean-Charles, for joining me. I mean, wow, this image has really demonstrated how much of the cosmos Euclid will reveal. And this image alone contains 100,000 galaxies. Over the next six years, Euclid will map a region 30,000 times bigger than this one, meaning that it will measure the shapes and positions of literally billions of galaxies. Now, our second image brings us somewhat closer to home, 10 times closer to be exact. And it's a beautiful example of how Euclid will reveal previously hidden individual cosmic objects. Let's have a look. This galaxy is nicknamed the Hidden Galaxy because it lies behind lots of dust, gas, and stars. And I'm happy to be joined by two ESA scientists. We have Guadalupe Cañas Herrera and René Larais. René, you are the project scientist for Euclid. Could you tell us how Euclid allows us to see this hidden galaxy? Right, this galaxy is in the plane of our own Milky Way. And because of that, we look to many stars past many stars and also gas and dust in our own plane. Euclid looks in the infrared and in the red. So it's false color what you see here. What is blue in this uh, image is really red on the, in real life. And what is red here is infrared, so it's invisible in real life. So what we see is basically the infrared and blue and uh, uh, red light from, uh, from this galaxy. Now, why the red and the infrared? Imagine the sun going up, coming up. It's red. And that's the reason why, that's because blue light is, uh, is scattered away or so absorbed by the dust and gas in our own atmosphere. Now, the same happens to, uh, to, to this galaxy. And I think we can see what infrared achieves here on the screen. Yes. Right? You see a little galaxy in the middle. Mm -hmm. So we don't look only through our own galaxy, but even through this big galaxy, to see the background galaxies. So this is amazing what, uh, what the infrared is doing. Incredible. And you also see all the uh, details here, the uh, little stars around, and this is in the spiral arms of this uh, big galaxy. Fantastic. Guadalupe, as a cosmologist, you must have seen images of many galaxies. How does this one compare? I think we can maybe go back to the big image and take a yeah. look. Right, the galaxies that I'm used to seeing, actually, they're like the small galaxies that we were seeing resolved in the arm of this amazing spiral galaxy. But it's just breathtaking. If I envision myself, if I have to Im imagine for a moment, a spiral galaxy will be really close <laughs> to this spiral galaxy. And it's uh, thanks to this kind of galaxies uh, that we can actually study an indirect detection of dark matter, because we study the rotation of galaxies like this one to actually infer how much that matter we have in our universe. So cool. And I mean, this galaxy does look very similar to the, the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy. How can studying galaxies like this one help us study our own home in space? Right, so as you said, we are in our Milky Way. We know that it is an spiral galaxy, but as we are inside the Milky Way, we cannot actually see the whole galaxy. This is why we rely on spiral galaxies like this one to infer uh, features and the nature of how these galaxies behave. So not only how they have formed, but maybe even their eventual fate, for instance. Fantastic. And we also hear that Euclid, as you mentioned already, will tell us a lot about dark energy. Rene, what does this beautiful spiral galaxy have to do with dark energy? Right, that's a good question. <laughs> Euclid will observe more than a billion, billions of galaxies in order to derive the structure of our universe. Now, 
if you observe a billion galaxies, you have to start with one. And this is the one. <laughs> so uh, many of these billion galaxies will be like this galaxy. And we will measure the shape as well as the distance to all these galaxies in order to uh, derive our uh, signs from it. So that is the dark energy and the dark uh, matter distribution. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rene and Guadeloupe, for joining me. Thank you. Isn't it amazing to believe that this image just took Euclid one hour to create? The fact that Euclid can take these large images so quickly is one of the things that makes it unique. When we look at this image, it is worth remembering that over its lifetime, Euclid will image billions of galaxies to reveal the hidden influence of dark matter and dark energy. But now, many uh, galaxies don't look like these quintessential spirals that we have just seen, but are smaller and lumpier. And these are called irregular galaxies. Now, our next image is an example of a small irregular galaxy. Let's have a look. So this galaxy is relatively nearby, so a neighbor, so to say. But many distant galaxies show us the, that show us the early universe are actually, in fact, irregular galaxies. So now I am here with Francis Bernardo and joined again by Jean-Charles Coulondre to find out more about this image. So Francis, can you tell us what's so special about this image of the irregular galaxy? Yeah, what's so special is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's, I mean, this is what, what we should keep in mind that Euclid is a unique, uh, has unique capabilities. This is the first telescope which can capture in one single exposure the entire galaxy, the surroundings, with this ex exquisite uh, resolution. So you have very sharp images all over, the, all over the, this image. So that's unique in the sense that even though you may have satellites out there, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, that have also very good uh, resolution, but the field of view is much smaller. That is, the area that can be captured in one single in one single exposure is much smaller. The Euclid field of view is about 100 times bigger than the one of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, and that's, that's unique for Euclid. And even if you think of ground Bay observation, you can reach similar field of view, but the resolution is by nature uh, degraded because of the atmospheric turbulences, and that's why we wanted to go to space, and, and, and this is unique about Euclid. Fantastic, and Francis, you are one of the leaders of the Euclid Consortium. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about the consortium and its role in analyzing images such as this one? So the consortium has been um, built actually and, and, and defined for the scientific exploitation of Euclid and for the full mission, for the six year mission we've heard about before. So it's in charge of many things, right? many tasks before on, on the consortium. The first one was to design and build the two instruments, the VIS and NISP instruments. It's actually in charge of organizing the, the, the observation, so, so actually uh, using the, the instruments, right? Uh, um, doing the, 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 the processing of the images. Uh, and Jean Charles is one of our specialists in doing that. And, uh, and then finally to do the, the, uh, the analysis, right? the, the, the scientific analysis of the, of the data we will get. That requires a huge variety of, of expertise and, and actually the consortium now gathers the expertise of more than 2,500 people, scientists, engineers, technicians, facing all of these difficulties, all these tasks. Uh, one number, one number. At the end of the mission, six years, we will have about one million images to analyze. That requires specific tools, specific knowledge in, in data analysis. If we see, we will start with these images, right? And uh, scientists have already well, process, it, process the images, Jean-Charles, uh, um, and, and started to analyze them in a, in a I mean, the scientific content and uh, uh, a publication, I mean, uh, yeah, the scientific publication will appear in a few months uh, that will be detailed what we see actually here. Fantastic. Looking forward to this. Now, Jean-Charles, Francis has already mentioned it. You actually led the processing of the data we received from Euclid to create these stunning images. Can you tell us what that felt like, what that process was? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I, was, I had the distinct privilege of having access to these first data. And those were a special program that was made to 
make people dream about what we're trying to do here. And so there was like a, like Carol said, I think 20, 20, 24 hours of, of, the, of uh, operation of Euclid 2 that went to these images. And so, of course, Euclid doesn't take a picture like your phone takes it. And, you know, it requires quite a bit of work, especially it goes from the infrared to the optical. You have to shift a bit like René was explaining about the, you know, how you build this. And so, obviously, for this small program of these five images, as it was already quite a bit of work. So I'm sure it's going to be a lot of work for the six-year mission. And so what we have here is, is was a like a complex process to take the data that come from space, which are affected in various ways, into what you're seeing today. And I think we actually have a close-up of the star-forming region. And I was very curious about this purple color. Maybe you can tell yeah, us it's more it's why a, it looks it's so. It's a very, very good <laughs> question about what is the uh, colors of the UK image? What do they mean? So I'm very attached when I picked the right colors, uh, the, the, the bands. And you know, Euclid is very sensitive to certain colors in space. And so how do you transfer this to our human vision on the screen like this one or on your phone? And it's, 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 so I, I made a, a choice that really maximize color range. And so things are rich. And so that's why you see in all these images which are released today, is like you, it has to be he has to have some humph, right? He has to, to really vibrate and, and talk to the people. And so, for example, this one is a star formation region at the vicinity of this galaxy, uh, this small galaxy we're talking about. You see uh, a sprinkle of stars which are uh, like advancers. That means they've been formed at some point. And so the color is purple. And so why is it purple? If you take the RGB, re red, blue, red, green, and red, it uh, means you have blue and red together. And so the blue is actually, as René was explaining, shifted from what we would see in the optical. It's what we call ionized gas, right? It's a part of the uh, for formation process when you have hydrogen, which is excited by young stars, so it, it shines like in blue for Euclid. And then you have like uh, dust scattering and so on that are adding component in the more red. So when you put the two together, there's no really light being emitted in the middle you get purple. So there's purple in the Euclid images. Fantastic. Love that color. Excellent. <laughs> well, yeah. Why are such crisp, clear images that we get now useful for scientific purposes? Yeah, this is a word, crisp and clear. And, and resolution is a key word for me. Uh, well, you can, you can really look in the detail. I can see it here. They are in the background of these, of these stars, of these, uh, of these blue region we see. Well, which we see here. We see many, many uh, galaxies, and this is what we are after. Basically, what I'm saying is that the resolution uh, is, so, is good over the, over the whole picture. It is good in all, um, in all wavelengths, in all, in all colors, and that makes uh, things possible for me, for the consortium, to, to, um, to identify a very large number of these background objects, and the, these background objects will be used to derive what we want to derive out of Euclid, that is, constraint of dark energy and, and uh, reconstruction of the expansion history of the universe. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Francis and Jean-Charles, for joining me. Now, during its mission, Euclid will generate vast amounts of data, the equivalent of about a million DVDs. And it's fascinating to hear how we turn all of those ones and zeros that Euclid sends down to Earth into the stunning images we are seeing today. And now we are entering inside the Milky Way galaxy, our home in space. Our next image beautifully illustrates how much information Euclid can capture in each shot. Let's take a look. So this um, image actually brings us two times closer to home yet again. And here what we see is what's called a globular cluster, a collection of hundreds of thousands of stars bound together by gravity. And this is actually the second closest globular cluster to Earth. Now, joining me today is Reiko Nakajima, a scientist working on one of Euclid's instruments, and Giuseppe Raka, Euclid project manager. Reiko, could you tell us more about what's so special about this image? Yes, uh, well, uh, as previously mentioned, to have the entire globular cluster in one field of view is, an, uh, is a feat that currently only you could, could do in space. Um, and so we have this enormous field of view that, could con uh, that contains all the stars in the globular cluster in one field of view, 
but also at the same time the high resolution where we resolved the single stars and we could count how many stars there are. In fact, the resolution is good enough that we can act actually see background galaxies behind these clusters of stars. Um, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. And on top of that, there is a little bit of processing magic that happens. When you want the faintest stars to show up in the image, you uh, take a longer exposure. But when you do that, the brighter, star wash, brighter stars can wash out the image, parts of the image. And in order to avoid that, what John Charles did was he combined uh, long, exposure, uh, long exposure images with the short ex exposure images so that we could resolve both the bright and the dim stars. Fantastic. And how exactly does the design of Euclid enable it to capture unique images like this one? Right. Uh, the e Euclid was designed as a wide field uh, uh, imager which means the telescope was designed so that it could capture a, a big portion of the sky at once. And this is an enormous, enormous engineering feat because you have to be in focus at this end of the corner, <laughs> this end of the image versus the other end of the image, and just as in focus as it is in the center of the image. Um, so there's the telescope design. Uh, we also have to have lots of pixels, 600 uh, million uh, more, <laughs> uh, it's more than 600 million pixels. And so that is uh, in the VIS instrument. Um, on top of that, we have to have an extremely stable pointing. If the spacecraft is jittery, we're not going to get uh, crisp images. But uh, we now have a very stable spacecraft. Fantastic. And so many things to consider for such an image. Giuseppe, you managed the entire Euclid project up until recently. Was this the kind of image you were expecting it to produce, or does anything surprise you? It's actually the kind of imaging we were hoping to achieve and uh, we are really very, very satisfied and proud that we managed really to achieve and to have this quality, the image quality itself, the, as uh, Raiko was saying, the jitters, the stability, the thermal control, everything really turned out to be uh, really has the objectives well. So that's really a great satisfaction. Fantastic. And how exactly will scientists use Euclid's images of globular clusters? The scientists will uh, observe this and will try to find also particular effect which is related to the general objective of Euclid, which is actually to uh, map the dark matter across the universe, so between galaxies. And uh, we are not actually, we will not be doing that generally within our own galaxy, but this type of images can also be used by the scientists uh, to really look at the distribution of uh, dark matter also inside our own uh, galaxy and around this uh, global cluster by looking at particular effects, uh, how the distribution of the visible matter is, how the stars are behaving if there is uh, certain things like tidal tails are called. And that would give an indication of what the dark matter is also inside our own galaxy. So it's really something, a bonus in comparison to what the regular observation of Euclid will be. Oh, incredible. Thank you so much, Raiko and Giuseppe, for joining me. So, as Raiko mentioned, no other telescope in existence can capture an image like this in just one sitting. They would need to take lots of smaller images with different exposure times and combine these together in a mosaic. So it's wonderful to see how Euclid is heralding a new era of astronomical imaging. So we still have one very special image to look at, and I'm extremely excited to share that with you. But before this grand finale, I want to talk to a couple of experts on how we have reached this point. Since its launch on the 1st of July, Euclid has faced some challenges. And I know that so many people have worked together brilliantly and put in a huge amount of effort to make sure that everything is operating. I have with me Micha Schmidt, who leads the operations of Euclid at ESA, and Paolo Musi from Thales Alenia Space. Thank you. Micha, could you tell us about some of the challenges you faced with Euclid over the past few months and how you've managed to overcome them? Um, yes, thank you, Pierre. So first of all, I mean, uh, the, uh, the launch and the early orbit phase and then commissioning is really the climax of the work. We are being prepared for that, so we start a couple of, uh, of years uh, uh, before the launch uh, to follow the development and develop our systems here. And then we go in some sort of simulation campaign here in this control room, the main control room, so this was our home. And uh, then you come to the launch where you really feel prepared. 
and uh, then everything comes uh, differently anyway and you have new challenges when you when you see the spacecraft working but first i would like to emphasize that actually um, we had a huge uh, amount of tasks on our plate so we had uh, 94 major blocks to be done we wanted to do this in 45 days but then giuseppe, uh, giuseppe who was here before told us no you do it in 31 days and we tick mark one after the other yeah and this was really smooth smooth operations and uh, thank you very much Paolo for this nice machine and um, um, we were able to do challenging things uh, like the focusing or like even the decontamination we were tilting the spacecraft to an angle uh, which was not foreseen so a little bit of sun was shining on forbidden areas and so on this all worked smoothly but then there are challenges of course and uh, these three major challenges or the elephants in the room you may have heard already before uh, where first of all we discovered stray light which should not have been this was easy to correct uh, so after it was identified actually we allow the spacecraft only to turn in a certain direction such that the sun shield um, actually hides the reflecting area from the sun so this was not easy easy for us because we avoid this it will be more a challenge for the people doing the survey later on because they need to have they have harder constraints mm -hmm. second thing was x-ray uh, we cannot do anything against this will occur so we will lose three percent of the observations we have to redo them or you take this into account in the processing and then there was another specific challenge um, the you need to um, keep the attitude of the spacecraft very accurate so if you take a picture you should not shake because otherwise the image comes becomes blurry i think we have an example of i think uh, they're so-called loopy stars here uh, where you can maybe explain okay uh thank you Kira. All, all the all the scientists get nice pictures and you give me that thank <laughs> you um okay so if you would like to keep stable imagine that actually euclid would be on top of mount everest and would, would looking down to the sea level once locked on a star formation with a special fine guidance sensor which was developed specifically for this mission you would be able not to leave the area of the bullseye of a dart um, 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 plate so that is 1.2 millimeters yeah for 15 minutes but even more it's not mount everest it's three times mount everest yeah and of course the FGS was not doing that so actually yeah so it was looping because the fine guidance sensor could not lock on the star formation because it was taking artifacts which come from cosmic rays and could not distinguish it from stars so then um, uh, the industry went back on, 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 on the desk and found a solution we have updated the software the software was loaded on board after some testing on ground and the problem solved Fantastic. Thank you so much. And it's really interesting to hear those numbers and imagine it with Mount Everest. So thanks for that example. Now, Paolo, you work for Thales Alenia Space, the company tasked with developing Euclid. What has your role been in the commissioning phase? Yes, the commissioning phase has been uh, quite an intense period, as Mika was, uh, was uh, recalling. Uh, and uh, the design team from industry, and from industry I mean uh, Thales Alenia Space as prime contractor, but also key industrial partner, partners like uh, Airbus and Leonardo and other partners provided uh, uh, engineering support throughout the commissioning phase. Uh, long days, also some long nights, quite some excitement and uh, a lot of satisfaction at the end. Uh, I want to um, recall three uh, special, let's say, key uh, moments of the commissioning which made this uh, uh, extraordinary image uh, images published today uh, possible. Uh, one uh, was the uh, uh, cold uh, stabilization uh, of the uh, focal plane of the telescope. We need low temperature for the infrared sensor. The second uh, uh, key step was the uh, fine alignment of the telescope on orbit, uh, where you can uh, get rid uh, of the gravity and the air, and you can do the perfect alignment. And the third uh, key moment was the proof of the stability of the pointing of the system. And this uh, last step required uh, some extra weeks because as suggested by, by Mika, we uh, characterized the uh, performance of the fine guidance sensor in the, uh, in the wide range of uh, star density from very low density and faint star to very populated uh, field and find out that at the extremes uh, the uh, sensor could uh, lose track of the stars. Uh, so after analysis of the data, we decided to uh, um, uh, add a piece of software, uh, which was better coping with the uh, uh, spurious stars generated on the sensor by the cosmic rays. And this was loaded in September, the second half of September. And uh, I think we are quite uh, happy of the results uh, 
after this recovery. And uh, I would also uh, take the occasion to, to thank ESA and uh, the science team for this uh, improvement that we were able to make because when we have to do with the, uh, really the optimization uh, of an end-to-end -end performance, we need uh, all the stakeholders uh, as part of the team. And I think we played a, a good team uh, teamwork. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Michi and Paolo, for joining me. So now that teams across ESA have solved routine and not so routine problems to get Euclid working so well, the dedicated operations team is doing the final fine tuning of the spacecraft before routine science operations begin in early 2024. Now, just before we reveal our final image, we've got a special message from our friends over at NASA. It is so exciting to be here virtually with you today to celebrate the first images from Euclid. This observatory will uncover a treasure trove of scientific discoveries that will be used across the world, including by US scientists, for years to come. NASA is a very proud contributor to this mission. We have been responsible for key pieces of hardware and engineering support, as well as a US-based science data center at IPAC in California. Additionally, NASA has provided funding and support for the US scientists to analyze Euclid data and contribute to the mission's science goals. Euclid will make a 3D map of nearly a third of the sky containing billions of galaxies. Together, ESA and NASA are paving the way for a new era of cosmology, providing huge amounts of detailed data about the history and the structure of the universe. NASA's forthcoming Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, on which ESA is a valued partner, also seeks to answer key questions about the nature of dark matter and dark energy. Roman will build upon what Euclid learns about these mysteries and will additionally survey objects on the outskirts of our solar system, discover thousands of new planets, explore nearby galaxies, and much more. So congratulations to the Euclid team. I'm excited to see the dark side of our universe through Euclid's eyes in the years to come. Thank you so much, Nicola Fox, for that kind and inspiring message. NASA has played a vital role in, you, in the Euclid mission. For me, hearing about all of these clever fixes that the team has come up with to solve the challenges Euclid has faced makes this last image even more impressive. Now, I know that many people will recognize this famous celestial beauty from images by other telescopes, but Euclid has brought us a whole new view. Let's have a look. Never before has a telescope been able to take such a wide and sharp view of the Horsehead Nebula in just one observation. And I'd like to welcome back Carol Mandel along with Jason Rhodes from NASA. Carol, I have to ask again, why is this image so special? Well, again, it's this huge field of view. This was just one hour of observations with Euclid. And as you saw as we had the zoom out, um, you could actually see little distant galaxies. I saw a spiral galaxy, a barred galaxy. So there are galaxies hidden in here. But of course, this is a very local neighborhood for us. And this is a very famous um, stellar nursery really stars are born here you can see dust you can see gas and you can see lots of physics that we'll be extracting from this image but it's the sharpness the crystal clear crispness the very wide field of view and the incredible detail that we've got along with the sensitivity to faint light across all of the bands combined together um, that make this image so special we could make this up with other images from other telescopes, but it would take us an awfully long time to take an awful lot of observations and stitch them all together. So, you know, you just get that with one hit. Fantastic. And Jason, can you give us an insight on the kind of things that we can see here in this image? Yes, in this beautiful image, as Carol said, we have a stellar nursery. We're seeing stars being born. And what we see here is gas and dust that comes from the explosions of stars that have ended their life in a violent explosion, 
spewed that gas and dust out, and that gas and dust is starting to coalesce to form new infant stars. In addition to the stars, we're seeing the formation of planets. Some of those planets will be bound to the stars, like our planets in the solar system are bound to the sun, but some will be free-floating planets, not bound to any star. We also call those rogue planets. In addition to the stars and planets, we hope to find brown dwarfs in here. Brown dwarfs are too big to be planets, but they're just a bit too small to be stars and undergo nuclear fusion and give off their own light. But what we see here, the stars, the gas, the dust, and the planets, and the brown dwarfs, they're all hot, and so they're giving off heat or infrared light. And so this is an image that makes great use of Euclid's infrared camera. The detectors for the infrared camera were provided by NASA, my employer, and NASA is a really proud part of the family of people making Euclid happen. So this image as a whole is a really great image for us to showcase the use of that infrared camera. Now, if you were to walk outside tonight and look at the night sky, you wouldn't be able to see this horsehead nebula with your naked eye because it's too small. But if you wanted to find it, you can find it in the belt of Orion. Fantastic. And I love the imagery of a star nursery. It sounds wonderful. But Carol, I'm so curious, why exactly do we see this horsehead shape? Yeah, so you can see this almost fold of or, or plume of dust and gas. And the reason that we see it almost as a shadow, it looks like a, a dark shadow, is because the actual uh, ultraviolet light that's being produced by the very young stars is absorbed by the dust. Um, so this is a tracer of the dust. And as Jason said, in the infrared, the dust emits light because you see it in the thermal, the heat signature. Um, but in the visible bands, um, the dust actually absorbs the light from the, the ultraviolet and the blue parts of the band. And so you get this incredible shape. And that really tells you something about um, um, what has produced this dust and it's, it's although it's a static picture you can see it feels almost dynamic. Fantastic. Now Jason how does studying the Horsehead Nebula help us understand dark matter and dark energy? So while Euclid's main goal is to understand dark matter and dark energy, we're going to do that by looking at visible objects, visible light. And what we see here is stars in formation. And understanding how stars form and evolve and how those stars come together and form galaxies and how those galaxies evolve is going to be critical for understanding the underlying physics of those galaxies. And it's studying those galaxies that is going to be what we do to help understand the dark universe. Incredible. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you, Jason. Wow, what an amazing image to end on. I hope that most people agree that these images are absolutely beautiful. But we are just at the very beginning of Euclid's journey. Um, before we conclude our event for today, we must absolutely discuss the next steps. So I am now going to be joined one last time by both René Laurais and Guadalupe Cañas Herrera to discover what is next for Euclid. René, I mean, these images are visually stunning, no doubt about that. But could you tell us more about what they mean for science? Will we get any results out of them soon? Yeah, you have heard the beautiful stories and also the kind of science and physics you can do. And there are indeed astronomers and physicists looking at these images and try to analyze and get the results out, what was mentioned before. So they are now working on papers in their analysis, and these papers will be published the beginning of next year already. So there is a really a frenzy in uh, getting this first data out. Yeah, that's very We strange. will also release all these data so that the whole world can also look at these uh, images and do science on it. So the analysis can be done by any scientist in the world um, in the beginning of next year. Fantastic. And Guadalupe, as a theoretical cosmologist, how do you feel about the science promised within these images? Well, it's a really important milestone, definitely, where these images can actually tell us is that the instruments of Euclid are working fantastically, that we are getting ready to start with the ultimate goal of Euclid, that is create this huge survey of one third of the sky, which is what we need to actually to go through the most interesting cosmological secrets of our universe. So trying to understand what is the nature of that matter, that energy and the underlying distribution of these ingredients all over this place. So really exciting, uh, feeling ready, feeling motivated with these images. It couldn't be better. Yeah. Fantastic. And I really feel the excitement today as well. So thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you, Renee, and thank you, Guadalupe. I mean, I can only say it again, wow, it's incredible. 
Today is a big day for Euclid. It is a big day for ESA, and it is a big day for humankind. To all of you watching, this is your telescope. And as these images show, Euclid is shaping up to be a truly incredible mission. I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers today, to the staff and the crew, and thank you to all of you at home for joining us today. It has been a pleasure. A big thank you must also go to Jean Charles, Cuyandre and his friend and colleague Giovanni Anselmi for the creation of the wonderful images that we've been able to look at today. I'm Chiara Monter and I'm very happy to have hosted this event to this point here in Darmstadt. Please do visit ESA's website, which you can see on the screen, to take another look at these stunning images. Download them in high resolution, zoom in on interesting features, see videos that pan across them, and read more about the objects that we can see. Euclid is ready to start its scientific journey into the dark universe, and we've seen the beautiful views from this edge of darkness. But this is just the beginning.